questions? Any questions? Oh. Get the microphone there. Sorry, I was just making a joke. How could you litter the Arctic with Jamesons? <laughs> Leaving your rubbish behind? <laughs> Sorry, that was just a joke. Oh, yeah. Well, it, it was very valuable stuff, of course, right? Because, yeah, but, uh, yeah. So, I'm wondering about, like you said, about the permafrost and how much carbon will be emitted and stuff like that. Are there any precautions or anything in the works if the carbon emissions become huge? Because that's going to be a tragedy. So is there, do you know of anything in the works to well, think it's really big? In terms of the permafrost thaw, thaw, no. I mean, if you're going to handle the permafrost thaw, right, you've got to handle the bigger problem of anthropogenic carbon emissions, right? If you don't handle that, right, then you can't handle the permafrost thaw. It's just going to follow and it's going to make the problem worse. That's why I say, I sort of say, you know, once the genie's out of the bottle, it's really hard to put it back, right? So that's the thing, you know, and it goes back to, um, you know, you've got to get to the root of the problem. There's been talk uh, about things like geoengineering, right? And the most, uh, uh, you hear a lot of talk about is you're going to put sulfate aerosols up in the stratosphere to simulate what a volcanic eruption does, right? To cool things off because it scatters solar radiation. And uh, it's a fool's game uh, because you're not solving anything. Uh, you're just putting a Band-Aid on it. Uh, you know, I could imagine a day where uh, if you don't deal with the carbon emissions, you've got real high carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere, but there's so many aerosols in the atmosphere you can't see to the end of the room, right? You're not solving it, right? So here with permafrost, though, it's a classic case of that you've got a root problem that you've got to deal with if you're going to deal with this one out here, and that's the challenge. Yeah. Um, I'm not an expert on this at all, but I recall that last year, uh, like a 11 mile piece of the Arctic ice cap broke off. Mm. So can you spend then the waters are rising due to that? Can you talk about that yeah, a little? I'm not, I'm not sure what event you're talking about um, specifically. Um, but what we're, we are seeing is that the Greenland ice sheet is losing mass in two ways. And I think that's probably where you're getting A large it. piece broke off. Yeah, okay. Well, it would have had to have been, if you're talking about the Arctic, it would have come from Greenland, I'm assuming. Okay. I, I, uh, but I, I, I would have to go back and look at that. What's happening to Greenland is that uh, there's more summer melt. So there's direct melt water that goes from the melt into the ocean. That's part of it. But what's happening also is that there's more discharge of big icebergs, big chunks, right, uh, going into the water. And that raises sea level because it's like putting an ice cube into water, right? All of a sudden the level goes up, right? Um, and what's happening is a couple of things. One of the things is that the ice, those glaciers are getting lubricated from the bottom. There's, there's melt water drained to the bottom of, of these uh, big glaciers, the way we call moulons and gives so much water pressure at the bottom that it literally lifts the base off a little and it can slide into the ocean, right? Also less back pressure effects. Um, if you look at these big glaciers that drain the ice sheets, like Jakobshaven or something like that, a lot of it's pinned to the fjord walls and that exerts a back pressure. that keeps it from flowing out too fast. But as the ice thins, which it is, the back pressure is left, now it can flow out more, right? So there's several processes going on uh, that can do this. Now, in Antarctica, okay, uh, you're seeing breakup of some of these ice shells, okay, so I'm not sure if you may be confusing one with the other, but in Antarctica it's got big ice shells and those occasionally break off and a big one broke off in this last year, so, uh, you know, we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. I was in Alaska. Oh, thank you. I was in Alaska the um, area around Anchorage a couple yeah. of years ago, and the locals said there's much more, they're noticing much more calving of the uh, glaciers sure. up there. And uh, my question is, in your honest professional opinion, which I highly cherish, <laughs> uh, do you think that we're past the tipping point? No, you know, I, I don't think so. Um, there's been a lot of talk about these tipping points. Uh, one of them that I'm familiar with is that people were thinking like, well, we thin the Arctic ice cover down to some certain critical level, or greenhouse gases that go to some critical level, and suddenly there's some kind of 
tipping point that you've passed and wham, you lose the rest of the ice in a very short tipping point, uh, time. No, what I see happening, and what I see continue to happen, is it's going to be a progressive warming with progressive changes. There's going to be spikes because it's always a variable sort of thing. Always has been, always will be, right? We could recover sea ice for five or ten years even. That wouldn't be unusual. I mean, it could happen, but the overall pattern is, is one of down. But I don't see, you know, a tipping point like of, of red, you know, like, uh, and, and I was one who even talked about tipping points some years ago, and I've backed off on it a bit, okay? uh, because I don't see it quite happening that way. Now, when you think about ice and snow, there clearly is a critical number, okay? that's 32 Fahrenheit, right? Uh, that once you start to exceed that uh, more strongly, uh, then, yeah, things start to change quickly because then you start to melt, okay? But in terms of just some tipping point, uh, at least in terms of climate, um, I don't really see it myself. Now, there are real concerns about ecosystems, right? Okay, this sort of thing, you know, microplastics in the ocean, this sort of stuff right now, which we're finally waking up to, right? What's going on there? <clears throat> I'm not an ecologist, so uh, I would have to listen to them. Yes. Okay, I'll be the one to ask about geoengineering yeah. and that they're engineering the weather in order to do all kinds of things. Any comments on that? Who's modifying the weather? I'm not an expert. Are you but talking about chemtrails? No, oh, I'm okay, talking about chemtrails is absolute nonsense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm sorry, so I'm, what do you... Well, what they call geoengineering, yeah. which is changing the weather patterns in order to... I'm not an expert yeah, on to, it. Well, but... to mitigate change, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mentioned that before. That the, there's a, a number of geoengineering approaches that have been talked about. Okay? Um, we need to be studying them. Absolutely, we need to be studying them because we do need to be ready if things really do go bad, if there is a tipping point, right? right? We need to be ready. Uh, but the real concern within certain, certainly in the mainstream science, is the law of unintended consequences. You try to solve one thing, you cause bigger problems somewhere else, okay? Uh, you load the upper atmosphere with sulfate aerosols in an effect uh, to try and cause cooling, okay, to offset the greenhouse warming, but then you cause massive drought in Africa or something like that. Unintended consequences. This is always the problem with geoengineering. Uh, we should be studying it, okay, but it should be absolutely a last resort. We can beat the carbon dioxide problem. We're already making inroads. That's what you've got to beat. Anything else is a band-aid. And what were you saying about uh, chemtrails? Oh, nonsense. Oh, this is, I, <laughs> you see this, is some, it's still alive somewhere. All right, this is idea that the government, whose government we're not quite sure, okay, is um, seeding the atmosphere with nefarious substances uh, to cause climate change and to end mind control, I believe, is involved in this, okay? The evidence for this is contrails that cross each other, right? So, oh, it must be a regular grid pattern that they're following, okay? Well, and then, then they say, well, contrails have changed through the years. Well, of course they have. Jet engine technology has changed. But uh, it is this sort of conspiracy theory out here, and it has uh, absolutely no basis, in fact. I have one more question sure. or comment. Uh, as we sit here, rainforests are being slashed and burned. Of course, they're a huge uh, resource for converting oxygen, uh, yes. carbon dioxide to oxygen. Um, are any governments really stepping up, like Brazil, which has the Amazon, and Indonesia, I know they're, they're, they're tearing down rainforests for yeah. palm oil plantation, oh, yeah. uh, uh, seeding or whatever. See, yeah. We're seeing signs, but certainly not anywhere where we need to be. You know, because what we have right now is that if you look at the um, greenhouse gas emissions, anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions, and per year, say, and you compare that to the observed rise in carbon dioxide level, okay, it's only about half what you'd expect, okay? That's because a lot of it's being taken up by the ocean, right? And it's being taken up through terrestrial biomass, right? So they're buffering 
the climate change. But there are limits to that, right? Can't go on forever, right? We're warming the ocean, we're acidifying the ocean, right? But uh, there's limits to that. So yes, rainforests are very much our friends, right? And uh, I just, all I can say is I hope we really wake up soon to be able to deal with this. Any more questions? We're getting uh, towards the end here. We have uh, ice cream coming up, organic ice cream. I have a question. Yes. What would you say is the most important, like if you were going to say one or two things that the public needs to know about the situation with the Arctic? I would say that it's real. The, I guess what I would say is we had long thought we had long theorized the Arctic is where the change happens first and where it is biggest, okay? And that is exactly what it has happened, okay? So in other words, the take home message is we know what we're talking about. I guess I could put it in a nutshell, right? We, that's what theory was telling us and now it comes out, right? There it is and so we see it and uh, um, we, we feel vindicated at some level that we were right, okay? But that doesn't make us feel any better. All right. Oh, one more, it looks like. I, my, my question is very similar. I want to be able to like make, summarize everything you just said and make it so that my child could understand it. Like, can you like just really emphasize the danger in like a sentence or two and help me to relay it? I, it's hard to summarize in a sentence, but we're, uh, all I can say is we're leaving our children and our grandchildren a very, very different world. And uh, uh, we all have a responsibility to deal with it. I, I really don't know what more I can say uh, beyond that. Um, uh, we'll beat it though. You know, we can beat it. That's the thing. You know, we're a remarkably adaptable species. We're, sometimes we seem to be very illogical, but you know, we're a pretty smart species too. This is not an unbeatable thing. Um, I also think we've got to be pragmatic. And I know I'm drifting off a little. We've got to be pragmatic, you know. Um, it's a big problem ahead of us. Look at this room, okay? Everything from the screen to the chairs to the lights to the jacket you've been wearing, right? They are all based directly or indirectly on a fossil fuel economy, right? That just shows you how ingrained it is, right? And unless you came to this conference here in a horse and buggy that you built by yourself, held together by hemp twine, which is legal in Colorado now. You know, we're all part of it. We're all complicit. You know, we, ha we have to stop pointing fingers at each other and start pointing fingers at ourselves, right? Because, you know, there's a lot of world that has nothing to do with this, right? That is just dealing with the consequences of this. That has nothing to do with climate change, right? They're suffering, okay? In the Western world, though, we are all complicit, every single one of us. And so that's why we have to be able to, you know, work together on this in a sensible way and in a pragmatic way as well. We got to have energy, got to have energy. Solar, great. We're seeing great inroads, absolutely. Hey, it's free, right? Well, not in a thermodynamic sense, but uh, in a relative sense, right? Sorry, I kind of drifted off there, but uh, anything more? Yeah. One more. I'd like to make one more comment uh, already. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I mean, you're really pushing my button. Um, already they're, they're referring to Miami as the American Atlantis. Yes. Miami is literally a doomed city and they're pumping right. hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars into pumping systems yep. and, and uh, dikes and this and that to try to save the city. Yep. But it looks like uh, the only way they will be able to save it is to just move the whole city inland. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, if you talk about climate, you know, uh, sea level rise, right? Miami's dealing with it already, especially on these especially high tides, you know, with a new moon or a full moon. Part of the problem with Miami is it's all built on limestone. So it's not that the waves come in, it actually comes in from the bottom a lot of it. What the heck do you do, right? But yeah, uh, in terms of sea level effect, it's here. Miami's already dealing with it right now. So this is something that's not out there in the future, sea level rise. You're already having problems with it. You combine that with a storm surge, now you get trouble. Uh. 
Lots of questions. I just want to say thank you for including the awareness that we all need of, of our complicity in using everything under the sun that is fossil fuel derived and plastics derived yeah. and that doesn't just use up a lot of energy yeah. making it, but also uses up a lot of um, loss of resources yeah. because it's not decomposable or compostable. What? When I try to tell people and, and kids, like there are people in my, you know, kids in my class or students in my class, is, is that you've got to start thinking of energy as valuable and start to think about like conservation as cool, right? You know, you turn off the lights when you leave, right? Uh, you don't crank the heat up, right, to, to, to heat up. You, you, you turn it down a little bit because all of that is a drop in the bucket. Every one of these things is just a tiny, tiny drop in the bucket but it has the critical thing of starting to change how we think, right? And unless we change how we think, we're not gonna beat this.